Welcome, Freedom House. How y'all doing today? Doing good? You look so great. Look at your neighbor and just say, you look so much better than you did last week. Just look at them. Thank you for joining us online. Let's give it up for all of our online viewers. Come on. Let's just welcome them. We have uh, people from India and then all over North America, just several hundred people just for watching today. Didn't my wife do a great job last week kicking off this new series? We just started a new series. We're in the second week called Pie Hole, and uh, we're just talking about the power of our mouth, the power of our words. She, she talked just awesome. I mean, I, I was out in the lobby after the services uh, last week, and a couple people came and said, I, you know, I don't even know if you got a job after this week. So I am, I'm working on my resume right now, and uh, some t-shirts that just say, vote for Troy, vote for Troy. So uh, if you see any of those, just make sure you vote for me. <clears throat> great, great week. And I'm going to continue that series today. I have a commercial that I want to show you to see if you remember this commercial. So look, look, at, look at the screens right here. You'll like this. Mr. Cow. Yes? How many licks does it take to get to the Tootsie Roll Center of a Tootsie Pop? I don't know. I always end up biting. Ask Mr. Fox, for he's much cleverer than I. Mr. Fox. How many licks does it take to get to the Tootsie Roll Center of a Tootsie Pop? Why don't you ask Mr. Turtle, for he's been around a lot longer than I. Me? <laughs> I bite. Mr. Turtle, how many licks does it take to get to the Tootsie Roll Center of a Tootsie Pop? Why, you never made it without biting. Ask Mr. Owl, for he is the wisest of us all. Mr. Owl. How many licks does it take to get to the Tootsie Roll Center of a Tootsie Pop? A good question. Let's find out. One, two, three, three. If there's anything I can't stand, it's a smart owl. <laughs> so how many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll Pop? Well, when they did that commercial in the early 1970s, uh, if you remember way back then, uh, they, they, they actually got tons of responses, over 20,000 responses, and they ended up anywhere from three to over 5,000 licks that it took. So Purdue University took it upon themselves to create a licking machine, and the licking machine came up to 324 licks to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll Pop. So uh, Betsy, here you go. Betty Greco, this is, this is for you, and you need to enjoy this the whole service. All right. <laughs> and uh, so we're, we're going to be talking about the power of the tongue. And it's a lot more powerful than just finding that, that sweet Tootsie Roll center of a Tootsie Roll pop. How many of you actually remember that commercial? Raise your hand if you remember that commercial. Oh, my gosh, look at all the people. High budget. It was very high budget, if you could tell. Just very, very high budget. Uh, we're going to be looking at, at the book of James. If you have your Bible, turn to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. My wife... Uh, did did a fan, such a fantastic job just setting the stage for this. And I want to just kind of talk through James chapter 3. If you don't know who James is, James was a pastor, and he was the pastor of the Jerusalem church. He was also Jesus' brother. And so he grew up with Jesus. Could you imagine what it was like in the household with Jesus? Matter of fact, James did not actually receive uh, Jesus. It actually didn't get saved become born again until after Jesus had ascended into heaven. His whole entire life, while he, was, while he was on the earth, James didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. I'm sure, though, that Jesus tried to convince him many, many times as a young kid. Can't you just imagine Jesus going, hey, James, uh, you know, mom just asked me to go to the grocery store. Watch this. Snaps his fingers. James, go to the refrigerator. Opens the refrigerator. There's already milk in there. See what I did? I'm the Son of God. I don't believe you. So they were walking to school one day, takes his sandals off, walks across a puddle. <laughs> See what I did right there, James? He goes, good trick, Jesus, still don't believe. So it just took him a long time. I'm sure it was pretty cool to be in their household. James was the pastor of the Jerusalem church. It was the center, the hub of the New Testament church. And so I really love reading through the book of James because what James does is he talks about making small adjustments in our life in order to have big results. Small things make a big difference. Why don't you say that with me? Say, small things make a big difference. Look at your neighbor and just say, small things make a big difference. Matter of fact, it's often the small things that no one sees that results in the big things that everyone wants. Let me say that one more time because that didn't sink in. I don't know if you heard me right there, but that's, that's, that's worth tweeting right there. It's often the small things that no one sees, the small things that we do that no one really sees that results in the big things that everybody sees 
and they want in your life. And so are you making small adjustments? So James talks about adjustments in dealing with temptation. And here we get to James chapter 3, and he starts talking about making adjustments in regards to our tongue, our mouth. John Wooden said this. He said, that it's the little things that are vital. Little things make big things happen. So the Solomon said in Song of Solomon, he says, catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vine. The little things can make a big difference. Come on, say it again. Say small things can make a big difference. All right, so follow along with me if you're, if you're, if you're online or, or if, you're, if you have your uh, Bible with you or you can go in your notes or look on the screens. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 12, and then we're going to really dive into this and, and break this down. My brethren, verse 1, let not many of you become teachers knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man. Underline that, perfect man, able also to bridle the whole, bo- the whole body. Indeed, we put bits, small things, in horses' mouths, they're big, that they may obey us and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, big things, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small, small things, rudder, wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member, small, and boasts great things, makes big difference. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. Now, that's an important thing. Underline that. It says, tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man, everybody say no man, can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it, with our tongue, we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude or the likeness of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh water. So when, when I read this, I, I love the whole book of James because it's a, you know, it's a pastor, and the way that he's talking to people, the way he's really doing it from a pastoral perspective And when I look at this, I see a few important things, a few power points in regards to the power of our tongue, which is what I want to talk about. Look at verse 1, and we're just going to kind of break this down. The first thing he says, he says, my brethren, which means he's talking to all of us, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. In other words, he's saying, when it comes to your mouth, when it comes to your tongue, you have a duty to know, if you're taking notes, write that down, a duty to know that my tongue can make a big difference. And so he challenges people who, who speak for a living, do, do, do what I do, and, and who are leaders. I think this really pertains to all of us, not just people who are standing on platforms or in front of groups of people, but every day you have the opportunity to speak into your family, to speak into your future, to speak into your life. And you have a duty, you and I have a duty to understand that it's in the strictest of judgment that God is going to hold us accountable for what we see. Matter of fact, the Bible even tells us that we all have little angels riding around with us taking notes of everything that we see. There's a book in heaven with everything that you said that's come out of your mouth, that's written down, and we'll be held accountable for that. Now, here's, here's the even higher thing in regards to our tongue, that it can make such a big difference because when you become a Christian... When you get born again, you have been now been given authority into the spirit realm. There is a realm of the spirit that's more real than what you're seeing right now with your natural eyes. Matter of fact, everything that you see with your natural eyes are controlled by what happens in that realm of the spirit. See, you are a spirit. You are a spirit. You live in a body and you have a soul, but ultimately... When you become a Christian, your your spirit man is born again, and you step into a place of authority that your words now go into an atmosphere that, as we sang today, creates space for God to move, 
or and and or it makes a difference in what we see spiritually. Now let me prove it to you. In Isaiah, one of my favorite encounters in the Bible, Isaiah was one of the major prophets, major prophets, one of the greatest prophets, and we'll see why in just a second. He was uh, he was struggling because the king that he was serving had died. His name was King Uzziah, and so what he did as as a good good believer in God, when when things started not going good, guess where he went? He went to church. So the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 6 that he walks into the temple, walks into the temple, and all of a sudden he has this vision where he sees God sitting on a throne. And the Bible tells tells us that that there are angels, seraphim, that were all around him. They had, they had wings that covered their face. They had wings that helped them fly, and they had wings that covered their feet. And the angels were crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And Isaiah is watching this miraculous vision, and he says, I, I, see, the, I see God's throne. I see God's train, his glory coming down, and it's filling the entire temple. His presence of God is here. Isaiah was having an encounter with God in the spiritual as he was in the natural. And then I want you to see what he says in verse 5, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5. It says, so I said, Isaiah is writing this, so I said, woe is me, woe is me, I am undone. In other words, I am, I am completely coming apart in this moment. And then what he says next is powerful because... Because I am a man of unclean, what does it say? Lips. Notice he doesn't say, I'm a man of, un, of an unclean heart. He doesn't say, I'm a man of unclean habits. Or I'm a man of unclean thoughts. He immediately goes to the important part of his life, which is his mouth, his tongue. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim. See, there were three levels of angels the Bible talks about. There's seraphim, there's cherubim, and then there's the archangels, Gabriel, Michael, and once there was Lucifer, who was actually in the presence of God until he got prideful and God kicked him out of heaven. And so... So seraphim were there, and one of the seraphim go out, and it says, then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it. And behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken. Notice that that his mouth was the, was the, the line to his iniquity or his sin. And that's what happens to us if we don't recognize how important our tongue can make a big difference in our life. Many of the places that you have found yourself in, you and I have found ourselves in, that we shouldn't be is as a result of our mouth. In situations, in moments. And so Isaiah, from this point forward, became one of the most powerful prophets. Did you know Isaiah prophesied about the coming of Jesus 600 years prior to him even showing up to the place where he was going to be born? He prophesied of the death of Jesus, specific things that happened in Jesus as he was being crucified for you. I mean, Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 53, one of the, the best accounts and mo- most prolific accounts, and this is when it all started right here in Isaiah chapter 6. Why? Because he understood the duty. James 2, 3, 2, look at James 3, 2. It says, for we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man. Everybody say perfect man. And it also able to bridle the whole body. Now the word perfect there doesn't mean without flaw. It means mature. It means complete. It means full grown. In other words, not only does our tongue make a big difference, but my tongue or my mouth shows my maturity. It it helps me develop who I am. It it involves my development, my development. My, My maturity is tied to my mouth. Now, James uses the word perfect or complete. It's the Greek word teleos, and, and he uses it six different times in his book, in his, in his book to us. Why? Because he wants us to understand that maturity is way more than experience. Matter of fact, I've met a lot of people who have, had a, have, have a lot of experience that aren't very mature. All right, now let me just tell you, today is a no elbow zone, so you got to tuck them. 
right here. There's none of this stuff. Not, you need to listen to this. This is for you. I'm getting the CD for you. I'm putting, I'm getting the, you know, you got to tuck them right here. All right, so no, no spousal elbows going on. See, maturity simply means using godly wisdom in a godly way. Using godly wisdom in a godly way. And there's many ways that we can determine our maturity level. We, we, would ter- we determine our maturity level by our persistence or our perseverance. When we're, go- when we're going through adversity, how do you handle it? And how do you know how you handle it? By what comes out of your mouth. By what comes out of your mouth. Temptation comes, adversity comes, trials come. How you handle it? When you're going through financial stress, how do you handle it? That shows your maturity. We also find our maturity in in regards to our relationships. How do you handle your relationships? How do you handle conflict? When there's conflict in your relationship. By the way, you don't handle conflict through email. That's a way to hide from conflict. Now, you handle conflict face to face. I refuse to deal with conflict through email or text. I'm breaking up with you. No, you don't do that via text. No, that, that's, that's cowardly. You deal with it face to face, and you deal with it with the right words. It all comes down to our words. We also, my self-awareness has to do with my maturity, how, how I'm dealing with me, how I'm managing myself, me, what, what's going on inside of me, how I manage myself. And this is, this is important when it comes to maturity. Many of us are really looking for a miracle when really we just need good management. We're asking God to do a miracle in our finances, but he's not going to do a miracle until you start managing your finances right. Mm, 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 I'm preaching good right now. <laughs> I need a miracle in my marriage. No, you just need good management in your marriage. Just, good man- just, just you need to manage your, your relationships. I need a miracle. Please, God. I need a miracle in my job. No, no, you just need to speak right over your job. You need to be thankful you got a job. Instead of complaining about the one you got. I know I'm preaching good. Don't shut me down. (laughs) See, development. My mouth shows my maturity. Just because you think it doesn't mean you need to say it. Tuck them. Come on. (laughs) Tuck them. And you you know what the highest level of maturity when it comes to our words is really not saying anything. Knowing when to not say something. Come on, we've all been around somebody, and you're like, oh, they shouldn't have said that. They just, that, that's, that was a mistake. I've been in meetings many times, and people just talk because they, they want to fill space. I, I was in sales a long time, and, and usually at the end of the sales call, when you were making the close, the first one that talked lost. I would sit there for 15 minutes and just staring at the, you know, waiting for him to get his checkbook out because we needed to make a deal, you know, and we'd just be staring at each other because we both knew whoever talked first lost. And finally, he'd say something. I knew, got it. You know, I'm not new. It was, it was done deal. So you got to know when not to say something. So James tells us, listen, he says, we're, 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 we can stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he's a mature man. That lets us know that there is a way to live that we will not stumble in word. Now look at James 3, verses 3 and 4. It says, Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths. Remember, small things make a big difference. Say it with me. Say, small things make a big difference. That they may obey us and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. This involves direction. My tongue directs my life. And I love how James uses two very intentional examples for the people that of this culture right then, when this was written around 30 or 40 AD. He, he was writing to people who understood the value of a horse. They knew the greatest form of tra- transportation was, was a horse. That was their Maserati. That was their Rolls Royce. That was their, that was their Volkswagen. That was their Chevrolet. They knew if they wanted to get from point A, the quickest way to get from point A to point B was, guess what? A horse. And they knew that if they didn't have a bridle in that horse's mouth, that they were, they were not going where they wanted to go. They were going where the horse wanted to go. And if you've ever ridden a horse without a bridle, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I have, and it doesn't work. I used to have a horse named Buck. 
His name actually meant what he would do. He would buck me off every single time. I would Because we didn't have a bridle, I could not control him. He talked about ships because ships represented, boats represented people's livelihood. Most of the people that he was ta- talking to were fishermen, fisherwomen. They understood, they understood the value of a boat, and they understood that if you put a boat that had a broken rudder, that boat was going to take you where the wind took you, not where the pilot desired. And so our tongue directs my life. See, if you're wondering why you are where you are today, it's because of what you said yesterday. If you're wondering why you are where you are today, it's because of what you said yesterday. What you said yesterday. Queen Elizabeth was one of the first cruise ships that was ever built in 1938. It had three acres of recreational space that people could recreate on, 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 the, on the main part of the boat. It weighed, check this out, it weighed 83,673 tons. The rudder, however, only weighed 140 tons. It was 0.1% of the size of the ship. See, listen, if you want to change your tomorrow, do, do, you, do, you, do you foresee a not, not good tomorrow? Guess what? You can change it today by what comes out of your mouth. You can use your tongue to determine what tomorrow will look like. Do you want, you want your marriage different tomorrow? Guess what? Start talking good about it today. You want your finances to change tomorrow? Then you start talking about your marriage in a good way, your finances in a good way today. You, you want your career to change tomorrow? If you want tomorrow different, then change what you're saying today. Change what you're saying today. Make a, realize that your tongue directs your life. Look at verse 5 and 6. He goes on to say, even so the tongue is a little member. Come on, say it with me again. Small things make a big difference and boast great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness, iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and, sets, and so sets forth So it sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. Fourth thing that I want to tell you is destruction. My tongue can destroy what I have. And he uses fire. Again, James is just, he's an awesome pastor. I'd go to his church. Awesome. He talks about fire. Everybody knew what fire was. Fire fire was the way that they kept their house warm. Fire was how they kept, you know, things lit. When they came home at night, fire was how how they cooked the meat, how they cooked the food. But listen, they also realized in the dry climate that they lived in, if that fire went into a wrong place, their whole house was gone in a second. Their whole life was gone in a second. They could just, their, 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 their life would be destroyed based on, on, on just this little spark, a little fire could change the whole landscape of their life. Your tongue is powerful. Your, your tongue has the power to give life or to take life, to give life or to take life. In 2007, they had one of the greatest forest fires in the history of the United States, one of the, one of the big ones. And it happened in, in California. Over 500,000 acres of land was destroyed. They tried to figure out what caused the fire. And one of the causes that destroyed almost half of that 500,000 acres was a little boy had a match he was playing with in the woods. And as a result of that one match, over 200,000 acres of the 500,000 were destroyed. One little match. So let me ask you a question. When it comes to your tongue, are you a life giver or are you a life taker? Life giver or a life taker? Do you give or take life in your relationships? Do you give or take life in your marriage? Do you give or take life in regards to your child's life, your children's life? Do you give or do you take life in your business environment? I mean, mean, let's take it a little deeper. Do you give, that, that involves everybody outside here, but what about inside? What about what's going on inside? Do you give or take life from yourself? When it comes to your inner talk, your self-talk, 
Now, I know, I know we've all met people what, that are professional. They are professional life takers. I call them verbal arsonists. Tuck them. <laughs> we, know, we know those kind of people. They, they are professionals. They, 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 are, they are wordsmiths, and they know exactly what to say, when to say it, and how to say it to do the most damage. Some of us grew up in households with people like that. Sadly, I, I believe many times, if not the majority of verbal arsonists, what they really struggle with is not with what is going on in here, out here, but what is going on inside. Because they are not only taking life to people around them, it's because they are constantly taking life inside from themselves. Now, we've all fallen into the category where we've made mistakes and saying something wrong. We've, we've kind of kind of taken life accidentally, and we got to be really careful that we don't say things to people that, that can be destructive, and we don't even realize. We're, we're trying to do, say the right thing. Maybe, we, maybe we, we just feel like we, we have a lack of words, and so we just say something like, like I've heard people say, so when are you going to get married? You're 34. What's happening? You have no idea how that affects somebody. They're struggling with their identity. They're struggling with their esteem. And then you just, you're just trying to you know, maybe start a conversation or make a little, <laughs> a little joke. <laughs> you know, the Bible talks about uh, you know, kind of taking over in something we say and calling it a joke. We got to be real careful that we don't, you know, are you, gonna, are you really, did, did you get your hair cut? Wow, it looks different. <laughs> are you going to go out like that? <laughs> now, we as husbands recognize the value of words. And the value of not saying anything. How do I look tonight? Great. <laughs> Automatic. Always. Great. How do I look in these jeans? Fantastic. But you haven't looked at me yet. I know. They're, you look skinny. You look fantastic. Beautiful. Gorgeous. I, I've made lots of mistakes as a pastor. And, and, and I, I remember a couple of them. So... Uh, I've tried to push them, you know, out of my psyche. But one, one particular time in church, and, I, you know, just a big mistake. You, you never ask a woman if they're expecting. Okay? I've made that mistake one time. So when, when are you, you, you going to have your baby? I'm not having a baby. I'm just fat. That's what she said to me. And she's like, high five, Pastor. <laughs> I'm like, feeling horrible. One time I said, so is this your mother? No, it wasn't her mother. It was her sister. Big mistake. Very, very bad. Very bad. She looked at me, and I mean, she literally sliced me in about 14 different pieces with her eyes. Uh, no, Pastor Troy, <laughs> it's, my, it's my sister, thank you very much. And I'm younger than she is. <laughs> so anyway, it was just, just terrible, just, just terrible. So we got to be careful that we don't, we don't do that. So, you know, the Bible talks about three specific big life-taking areas. The first, the Bible talks about lying, lying. Lying is a big life-taker. Now, we think that lying protects us. From really sharing the truth, but or or maybe maybe they don't just a little one. Just I'll just say something little. You can always tell. Remember maturity development by when you're pressed in a corner, how you respond. I just you know she doesn't need to know everything. He doesn't need to know everything. If I just kind of leave a little bit of it out, it's okay. Well, that's lying. Proper uh, Ephesians chapter four verse twenty five. It says what this adds up to is to then is this no more lies, no more pretense. Tell your neighbor the truth. In Christ's body, listen to this, we're all connected to each other. After all, when you lie to others, you end up lying to yourself. So be honest. Be honest. The second is gossip. I believe that's the biggest, big area. Big area. The Bible says in Proverbs eleven thirteen, 13, it says, A gossip goes around telling secrets, but those who are trustworthy, everybody say trustworthy, can keep a confidence, can keep confidence, trustworthy, be honest, and be, be loyal. And so many times we mask gossip in prayer requests. Well, guess who I was talking to yesterday? Oh, I was talking to Makita, and 
oh, we just need to pray for her. She's really, she's really struggling. Let me tell you what she's struggling with. We just, oh. We need to pray for Makita. Don't you feel God right now? I do. I feel God. No, that's not God. That's called gossip. No, Makita came to you to share what was going on with her because she needed somebody in confidence that would truly pray. See, instead of, instead of saying it, pray it. Instead of saying it, pray it, pray it. Always revert, revert back to the prayer part of things. Always, if you feel any hindrance where you think maybe you're crossing the line, you have crossed the line. That conviction where you might be sharing too much about a situation. The best thing you can do is shut your pie hole. You can just shut it down and just don't even go there. And just don't even talk about it. And then the last area, the big area, and there's lots of different life takers, but another big area is strife. Strife, strife in Proverbs 16, 28, it says a perverse man sows strife. Perverse man. A whisper separates the best of friends. Strife means discord or disharmony or contention. It's, the, it's that... It's that, that place where, where you feel like always there's contention and, and division. Now, the re- reason why people participate in gossip and strife really is they want to be in control. They feel out of control inside, and in order to feel in control on the outside, they start talking about others. It's a deflection mechanism. It's a, it's a way to get the, the, the heat off of themselves and onto someone else. Many times we gossip because the very thing that somebody told us about really is what we're dealing with. We're, we don't want to want to share with anybody else, and so we need to share somebody else's stuff with somebody else in order to make our stuff seem so little. And really, it means we're just trying to be in control. Strife is the same thing. See, if I can get people to divide, then I'm in control. I'm in control. Strife is extremely potent. You know, in a church, we, in this church, we don't put up with strife. We deal with it head on. Head on. See, my mom taught me something very young. You, you know this. Your mom probably taught you the same thing. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. If you can't say something good, let me say it another way. Skip it. Just skip it. And then here's another thought. Here's a life-giving thought. If you think something good, say it. Say it because you have no idea. You and I have no idea how powerful just a couple, just a couple I believe in yous. I'm proud of you. I saw what you did. I saw how you handled the situation. I want to encourage you. I'm praying for you. Man, you're great. Wow, you're a good father. Man, you're a great husband. Wow, you're a fantastic wife. Hey, did you, I just wanted to tell you, I love you. Hey, I wanted to tell you, I'm caring for you. Just those little things that we can say have a huge impact. Small things make a big difference. Several weeks ago, a young lady was making a beeline for the door. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm out there greeting people and talking, and I saw her kind of walking, and she just kind of had her head, you know, she was just going as quick as she could. And so I just reached out, and I kind of grabbed her, and I just said, hey, thank you so much for coming today. Immediately, as soon as I said something to her, tears started streaming down her face. She goes, Pastor Troy, thank you so much for stopping me. I said, well, what's going on? What's happening? She goes, when I walked out of service today, I said, I'm not going back to church anymore if, if somebody doesn't stop me and ask me how I'm doing because I'm not doing good. My marriage is about to split up. I'm having such a hard time in my family, and I don't know who to talk to. And, and I just I threw, I threw it up to God. I said, God, if nobody talks to me today, I'm never coming back to church again. You have no idea. No idea. Just three little words. Hey, thank you for coming. That's more than three, but just you don't follow what I'm saying. <laughs> thank you for coming today. Thank you for being here today. I had no idea. No idea. If you think it, say it. We have a little thing in our, in our house. My wife and I started several years ago. Um, I don't know who we heard it from, but we have what are called withhold lunches. A withhold is something that you say to somebody because when they did it or didn't do it, you really didn't think about it, and then you leave their presence, and then you realize, oh, man, I'm, they did this, and then you want, you want to do something for them. You want to say something to them. And so my wife and I will get together. Usually on Mondays, we'll sit down across from each other, and, and we'll just tell each other withholds, things that she did 
that, that were just awesome. And I, in the busyness of life and parenting and pastoring and working and doing all that stuff, maybe I just missed the moment. And so I'll just, hey, you remember when you did this? I just wanted to tell you, man, I love you so much. I love you so much, sweetheart. You're so great. You're such a great mom. When you did this for the kids, you know, when you, when you made that meal and everybody was busy and, and when you said this, uh, it just meant so much to me. Withholds. Withholds. I'm telling you, you start, you start sharing those things with people, it changes the whole dynamic of the atmosphere, the whole dynamic of your life. After I shared this last night at church, a couple came up to my wife and said, you know, we took it to a whole another level. Uh, we have what's called a withhold journal because they heard me talk about this once before. And so what we do is we, we write a withhold, leave it on our spouse's pillow every night. And we just trade back and forth. Once they write something, they put it on my side. And once I write something, I put it on their side and just goes back and forth. And then we can go over during times of vacation when we're just us and we can just read through the withholds and it just really encourages us. Because we all go through down moments, don't we? We all go through challenging moments. We all go through times where we feel like nobody's for us. When the faith, when the faith you know, meter is down here, and I'll, if we could just have somebody say they believe in us, can I tell you, that's so life-giving. That's so life-giving. How about if the church started acting like that? How about when we got, after being 35, 40 minutes in the line at Walmart, we were happy <laughs> and started giving life to the cashier? Come on, can I get an amen in the house today? Here's the last thing I want to say to you. Look at, look at James 3, 7, 8, 9, and 10. It says, For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. Notice it doesn't say that nobody or nothing can tame the tongue. It just says no man can do it. In other words, sometimes what the Bible doesn't say speaks very loudly. And so no man, in a, what he's basically saying is God can do it. If you'll just yield yourself to God. No man can tame the tongue. It's unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have made in the light made in the likeness of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a, can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives and a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt, water, and fresh. See, the last thing is display. Display. My tongue displays who I am. My character is on display by what comes out of my mouth. Because ultimately, listen very closely, ultimately, my, my tongue, my mouth, my words are the fruit of my heart. My heart is the tree. My mouth is the fruit. Whatever is in your heart is going to come out of your mouth. So the word, if we want to change what comes out of our mouth, guess what we have to do? We've got to change what's in our heart. We've got, to, we've got to have, and this is what I love about God. God doesn't just say he's going to fix your heart. You know what he says? I'll give you a brand new one. I like brand new stuff. I, I'm not just going to repair the areas that are broken. I'm not just going to put things back together. I will give you a brand new heart. And so when you yield yourself, Jesus said it this way. He said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the overflow of the heart. When I was a youth pastor, I um, had this, I mean, uber talented young lady who played keyboards and sang. I mean, she sang like an angel. I mean, she was just so talented so talented. And, and she just kept getting better and better and better every time. She was like 13 or 14 years old. It was, it was pretty amazing how good she was. But something happened. We did a couple of services in front of the, you know, I was a youth pastor then, so we did a couple of services in front of the whole church, and, and people started coming to her and, and telling her how great she was. And, you know, at 13 or 14 years old, she just, she didn't, she couldn't handle it. And it kind of went to her heart. And she started to think, well, you know what? I am great. I am good. And pride started to get into her heart. And so one particular night, we had Sunday night services, and we just had this incredible move of God. And, and she was playing and singing. And I came up on the platform and basically directed the service. And after the service, she just started, I mean, 
14 years old, 13, 14 years old. I'm the youth pastor. I'm in my mid-20s. And she just starts ripping into me. Who do you think you are? I, I, run, I run the worship, and I'm in charge, and I'm the one, and I can't believe you did that. And so the next day, I had to sit down with her and just and have a little conversation, a little one-on-one. And, and my wife and I was there, and, and, and we just sat down. I remember it very specifically. We were sitting on the edge of the platform, and I just said, so what's going on? And then all of a sudden, bitter and, and sweet started coming out of her mouth. Back and forth. She, she would say something, and then she would say something really negative. And then, she, then her, see, because her mouth betrayed what was in her heart. She was trying her best to hide it, but she kept saying it loudly. And I had to remove her from the platform. I had to pull her off of the, she was great, but I had to remove her. Because I wasn't just going to have talent. I wanted heart. Let me just tell you something about this team that's up here. Just in, in, in a parenthetical moment. Everybody on this team up here that's leading worship, has a pure heart for worship. I mean, these, these folks up here love Jesus with all their heart. <clears throat> and the way we know that is by what comes out of their mouth. Because your heart, your, your mouth will betray what's in your heart. Whatever is in abundance will come out. You can try to hide it. We can try to hide it, but ultimately it's going to come out. And it really identifies your character, who you are. Well, later on, um, this young girl, she, several years later, uh, after we had left and, and she went on and uh, I believe she got married and had, had babies and all that stuff, she, she Facebooked me and said, you know, I just wanted to apologize to you about what happened because I realized my heart was impure. And she just started repenting on Facebook and just, you know, she lived in another state then and, and it was just so awesome to see. You know what happened? God gave her a new heart because she asked for it. You know, today you can have a new heart. You can have a new heart. I believe there are people in this room, maybe watching by video, listening online, watching online, that because of the words that were spoken of you when you were younger, even now, your heart has become hard. And as a result, your words are harsh. Life taking instead of life giving. But I do know you have a God, a loving Father, who will give you a brand new heart. Heart. He'll give you a bread. He will take that heart of stone out and give you a heart of flesh. I want you to do something. Would you stand with me really quickly and bow, bow your head and close your eyes? And I just want to pray with you. Just want to pray with you before we go home. Everybody in the place, just close your eyes. Bow your head. Just you and God. Are you are you struggling with a Heart of a hard heart, heart of stone. Do you, do you are you finding that your words are harsh and hard and life taking, and it's almost as if you can't control it? The truth is, you can't, but God can. And the minute that you give your heart to Him, release your heart to Him, He will give you a brand new heart, and you'll see your words turn around. Your tongue will change the direction of your life. Your tomorrow will be better than it is today. I want to pray with you. If you say that's me, I need to change what's coming out of my mouth because I know I need to change my heart. Would you just put your hand on your heart right now? Just put your hand on your heart. Maybe, maybe you're a husband today and you realize your marriage is a result of your mouth. You know, it could be better. Let's change. Let's change today. Your wife. You know, your business could be better. You're a business owner and you realize that you've been speaking doubt and unbelief over your business. Let's change your heart. You worry. Worry comes out of your mouth, and, and you realize that there's insecurity in your heart. Let's change your heart. Let's ask God to give us a new heart. Father, I just pray right now that in our sincerity, and, and, and God, as we come to you in this moment, we just sense your presence here. The Holy Spirit is here to, to give us heart transplants, to give us a brand new heart. And so, Father, I, I pray that, that the tomorrows that will leave this room, that the tomorrows that are represented in this place will be so much greater, so much incredible, that tomorrow we will wake up and, and, and God, we will know everything has changed. Why? Because our hearts have been changed and our words have followed after our hearts. If you put your hand on your heart or you wanted to, just say this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for taking this heart of stone and replacing it with a heart of flesh. Holy Spirit, Come and fill me up to overflowing. 
to abundance so that my mouth will speak words of life in Jesus' name. Now, just everyone, just lift your hands to heaven. Just enjoy this, this presence right here right now. Father, thank you for your presence that's in this place right now. Thank you, God, for your awesome, awesome glory, your awesome holiness, God, in this place. Incredible presence, Lord, solidifying this word, Father. And God, it's my prayer. It's my, it, I believe, I believe that things are turning around today. I believe, God, that even on the ride home, there's going to be withholds that are literally going to change marriages. Withholds, God, that are, that are going to change the direction and the trajectory of kids' lives today. Yeah, there's, there's somebody in this room right now, and you've been speaking a little bit of, there's been fear over your teenage son, your teenage daughter, about their life. Listen, instead of speaking fear, speak faith over their life. Start speaking faith. They're going to turn around. They're going to come back to God. Matter of fact, I see them sitting right next to me in the coming weeks, lifting their hand, worshiping God, receiving Jesus in their life. Just begin to declare that and decree that over your family, over your teenage son, your teenage daughter. They're, they're coming out of trouble into mercy. They're coming out of heartache into grace. In Jesus' name, we just believe it, we confess it, and agree right now. Turn around. It's turnaround time. It's turnaround time in our families. In Jesus' name. And everybody shouted, amen. Come on, let's just thank God. Awesome, 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 awesome. Well, I believe that you are the greatest church. I am so honored to be your pastor. Thank you so much for just being awesome people. You love Jesus. I'm so proud of you. Hope you have a wonderful day. Look at two or three people as you leave and say, man, small things make a big difference. You may be dismissed. God bless you.